that's the great news. Okay, um, so um, the aim of this part of the tutorial is to make sure that everybody is able to do uh, very simple uh, natural language processing applications, right? So that's the key idea. And also to give you some insight into why uh, natural language processing is a hard problem, okay? Um, okay, so um, we will have some opportunities to do some classwork, and also this evening you'll have uh, time to actually implement some of the problems we'll discuss during the class. Okay, um, so I want this session to be fairly interactive. So uh, if you don't understand something, then please uh, stop and ask questions, okay? Don't wait till the end to ask a question. There won't be any questions at the end. All the questions will be during the session. So no questions at the end, okay? <clears throat> okay, so let's get started. So, um, so to give you some idea about uh, some of the potential applications of natural language processing, so this is a, a system we built in 2002, okay? Uh, so this was a system we built um, <coughs> as a virtual assistant uh, with the idea that we want to partially replace the call center. Because typically, you know, the call center, we get a lot of calls, people ask a lot of questions, a lot of those questions are very simple and easy. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is that can we have a virtual assistant to offload, let's say, 50% of the questions? And if the system is not able to answer those questions, then the virtual assistant would itself say, you know, I'm not able to answer your question. I don't understand what you're saying. Maybe I'll get a real person to give you a phone call. Would you like to enter your phone number? And then uh, the system will get a real person to, um, you know, answer the question. So that's the idea. So this, uh, furthermore, in this particular application, um, what we were trying to do was to do question answering with a dialogue system on a limited domain, on a small domain. So in this case, the domain is just individual savings accounts. So <clears throat> this system was trained to only answer questions uh, for this particular domain. Yeah, um, and then we uh, managed to deploy this uh, for HSBC, which is a big bank. Um, so this was live, I believe, in 2002 uh, in uh, HSBC. Their bank is called First Direct uh, in the UK. It's an online bank. Um, <clears throat> and we deployed it to answer questions uh, relating to their mortgage product, which was called Smart Mortgage. Okay. So this was possible even in 2002, uh, well before deep learning, well before even proper machine learning. Um, so um, we had a virtual character, which was a full 3D, half 3D, half body 3D. It could, you know, move, move its head, raise its arms, uh, even smile, uh, depending on the question. Um, and uh, so at that point in time, we didn't have a voice recognition system. Uh, so you have to type in the question, but the system generated its response uh, with voice and full 3D animation. Okay? And also I should say that uh, I coded most of the NLP engine using a language called Prolog, so which you may or may not have heard of. So, okay. <laughs> So even with that technology, it is feasible, okay? Um, <clears throat> and then uh, we were also able to deploy this kind of system. Uh, we had the idea that because this is a domain-specific uh, question answering natural language processing system, ideally in a smart home environment, we would expect uh, that you can converse with your everyday devices in plain language. So we had a big project to deploy it into fridges and um, microwaves. I don't think we managed to deploy it to a microwave, but we did deploy it to a fridge, and this fridge is on display in our department even now. Uh, um, so it's been, I think we built this in 2005. Okay, any questions? 
Yeah, so we're going to keep this very interactive. So the idea in this fridge was the fridge knows what's inside the fridge. So it's going to tell you, you better eat your, your bananas because it's about, <laughs> it's going to go off. <laughs> or uh, today you have to be non-vegetarian because your meat is going to go off. Or you have to feed your guest only mushrooms because that's all that's left. Uh, and it'll generate recipes based on what's already inside the fridge. <clears throat> And then it can monitor how much you've eaten every week and automatically generate your shopping list. Um, so you can see that you can build a fairly simple, very limited domain application. So this phrase doesn't understand anything else apart from things inside and recipes. Right? <clears throat> okay, so, so what is uh, natural language processing about? Well, the ultimate goal of uh, natural language processing is to build machines that can understand human language. Well, the question is, what does understand mean? So what does understand mean? Right? Because uh, that's kind of a bit of a loaded question. Okay? So, uh, so it depends on what you mean by understand. But ideally, we want uh, a natural language system to not just understand the words, what the words are, but understand the meaning behind the words, right? Um, <clears throat> so in natural language processing, the point is there are two different things. One is that you have a meaning associated with a word, and secondly, you have a meaning associated with a sentence. And the idea is that we use this notion of compositional semantics to construct the meaning of the sentence based on the meaning of the parts, right? And natural language inherently has this compositional semantics. And that's what makes it possible for human beings to understand language, to learn new languages. So without this notion of compositionality, it would be impossible for us to learn new languages in a short amount of time, okay? So there are other things that also make it possible but I think compositionality and compositional semantics is a, a key thing. We also distinguish between speech versus natural language processing in the sense that the speech recognition problem is taking an audio input and generating a textual representation. The natural language processing problem is taking a textual representation and generating an interpretation, a meaning representation, right? Which could potentially is be situated in a dialogue, okay? So the question is, why is natural language processing hard? Well, you know that uh, you have your Java compiler, uh, you have your you know, favorite compiler for your favorite programming language. Your compilers can understand what you've written, your Java program. So why can't we build a compiler for natural language? Why is it hard? Okay, And there's a simple reason for this. The reason is ambiguity. So natural language exhibits ambiguity. <laughs> ambiguity is inherent in language. It's impossible to remove that ambiguity. That's because we use ambiguity to communicate efficiently. Um, <clears throat> so for that reason, ambiguity is always present in, a, in language, whereas ambiguity is absent in a programming language. Right? So that's why it is easy to build a compiler for a programming language, whereas it's very hard to do the same for natural language, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking to you. All right, so we have ambiguity in language at every stage of the processing. So even at the uh, speech level, uh, when I say I scream versus I scream, um, can you tell the difference? So it is, sorry? Sorry? The pause, the pause, you need to speak louder, okay? Um, okay, yeah, so there is a pause, but that pause is uh, very short. So as it turns out that if you actually look at the pauses, in, in, in what we say, you would actually see that the pauses actually occur 
quite a lot halfway between a word. So, you know, so typically because words are broken down into syllables, you would have pauses between syllables. So actually using this idea of looking for pauses is not a, doesn't always turn out to be a good idea. <coughs> okay? So I was deliberate there when I just said, I scream versus I scream. You know, if I was fast, it would have been difficult. Okay, we also have ambiguity at the next level. So we would have <clears throat> ambiguity, for example, at the syntactic level. I saw the man with the telescope. Uh, who has got the telescope? Does the man have the telescope? Or do I have the telescope? Okay. Okay, raise hands if I have the telescope. No one. Raise hands if the man has got the telescope. Okay. But you can see that uh, there is ambiguity. So this kind of ambiguity in English is known as a prepositional phrase attachment ambiguity. And it's very common uh, in English. Um, <clears throat> so next, next one, flying planes can be dangerous. Does it imply that if you fly a plane, it's dangerous? Or does it imply that if you see a flying plane, it's dangerous? Okay. <clears throat> intelligent men and women. Does it imply that women are intelligent? Or is it only men that's, who are intelligent? Okay. Um, so the next one, we've, we've seen this already. I went to the bank, uh, but did I catch a fish or did I, you know, empty my wallet and deposit all the money in my wallet? <clears throat> and we could also have pragmatic ambiguity where the semantics is the same, but the way, for example, two different person understands what I've said could be different. You know, let's say I know him very well, and I say something, he understands it differently to how he understands it because of the previous history of the conversation I had with him. So that kind of ambiguity could be a pragmatic ambiguity, right? Okay, moving on. So how would you build a <coughs> system like the one I've just shown you earlier? So here would be a very simple uh, architecture. Um, so you would have your user query. You might want to do some spelling correction uh, because, you know, if there's a spelling error, you don't want to ask the user, did you mean this or that? That would be very annoying. Uh, <coughs> you would uh, do some tagging. So that is just a part of speech tagging. So the key point about any NLP pipeline is that what is happening in an NLP pipeline typically is that if there are multiple stages is that every stage of the pipeline is attempting to remove some ambiguity. Okay? So you have the ambiguous input at every stage of the pipeline. You, you do not try to directly interpret everything, uh, but you try to remove some ambiguity. Okay? So that's the typical uh, process we do. So we might want to do some pausing and then after that, we have a parse structure. We could do a matching against a uh, you know, previously stored input. And then once you have a match, you're going to have lots of matches. Because if the user's uh, question is very short, you know, tell me more about it. Well, tell me more, more about what? Right? So you could have a lot of matches. And then you have a dialogue engine, which is going to look at the history and decide, OK, which one does the user mean, right? And then if you have a 3D engine, you then need to decide based on the response whether the agent should smile or frown or shake its hand. Um, and then uh, you generate the gesture uh, information and pass it to an animation client, okay? And hopefully you have an engaging response, okay? So um, a classical NLP pipeline would look something like this. You have your input. You might do some morphological analysis to say, you know, walked is the same as walk uh, in a past tense. 
you might generate a parse tree to say that the hobbit is a noun phrase and walked is a verb. <coughs> then you might want to generate a logical representation to say there's some event X and X is a walking event. Um, <coughs> and, you know, um, sorry, X is the person who walked and X is a hobbit. Okay. And in this particular case, uh, given the dialogue history, you might want to say that, well, X actually is Bilbo based on the history. <coughs> okay. <coughs> okay, so um, now if you uh, move on, fast forward to the current deep learning pipeline, uh, the pipeline typically looks like this. Okay, so you might have the Hobbit walked, you would have a word embedding matrix, uh, which we'll discuss in a second. And using this word embedding matrix, you have a neural network which will generate a sentence representation. So you're going to short circuit all the way to here, to the semantics part, and then you would, you would have a sentence embedding representation which you then use in a downstream application. Okay, so now I move on to an application uh, in NLP of uh, very basic machine learning. So this is just using our uh, knowledge we've gained so far in, uh, uh, <coughs> in using Bayes' rule. Okay, so, um, so how would you go about doing a spelling correction? So if you have something like, tell me about the benefits, uh, well, there's an error there in the spelling. But typically, you can classify your errors into like either, either insertion error, deletion error, transposition error, where you've got this swapped, a repetition where the N is repeated. You have a replacement, so some letter being re replaced by another. Okay, so you have this classification of different types of errors. So previously, what people would do would be <coughs> they would use what's known as an edit distance, okay? also known as a Levenstein distance. So you have an error word, A-C-R-E-S-S, -S, and now you <coughs> apply one of the transformations. So you do an insert T, and you get actress. Okay? You swap A and C, and you get caris. Replace R with C, and you get access, and so on. Okay? So all of these are possible corrections. So typically, what people used to do was take the uh, correct word with the shortest edit distance. Okay, obviously we have a problem here because the edit distance is one for all of these corrected words, right? So obviously this technique is not good. Yeah? Okay, so how can we try to solve this? So we can use a statistical spelling correction. So we can use Bayes so uh, T is our typo, incorrect word, and C is our correct word, okay? So we can say that the probability of the correct word given the incorrect word is given by Bayes' rule, okay? Uh, one of the reasons we want to use Bayes' rules is that because this probability of C, <clears throat> we can estimate reliably, and also this conditionals, so we can... It, we can estimate all the terms on the right-hand side from data quite easily, okay? And then we can say, well, the correct <coughs> word we're interested in is the one which maximizes this probability, okay? So this is a map estimate, if you want to think of it like that, okay? Any questions? Okay, yeah, can you speak loudly? That's very, very good, okay? So that is a semantic error, yeah? So, uh, so a typical way we want to handle that is using a language model, right? So you could use a language model to suggest what could be a possible word, okay? But I think that's a hard problem. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> But however, this uh, probability of this typo, incorrect word, given this correct word, is very sparse. Okay? This is because you need to go collect a large corpus. You need to find out all the incorrect words, 
and then you need to find its correct words. Okay? So this probability table is very sparse, right? You don't want to, and it's not going to work if you already don't have an incorrect spelling and a corresponding correct spelling, right? So this is not a feasible way. So one approximation is to just say, okay, uh, the error type, so we know the error type, it's an insertion error, deletion error, repetition error, but conditioned on just the previous character, single character, okay? So for given a large corpus, we, which incorrect and correct spellings, where we have the corrected and incorrect spellings, we can then estimate this conditional probability from data, okay? And there are papers, so this uh, method was invented by Church et al., and, and it has been extended by these guys later on to multi-error uh, case, okay? So here's an example, and this is the, one of the first exercises you'll be doing in the lab today. So you, all of you will be building a spelling corrector, which is a nice thing. Um, <coughs> okay, so, um, <coughs> so you have the word actress, and you have the probability of the word actress, which can, you can estimate from a large corpus, right? That is just the count of how often this word occurs, okay? And you have the delete, you have the error type, okay? <coughs> and so to get this word from the incorrect word, uh, you have to use that transformation, deleting of T, given the previous character is C, right? So that T has to be deleted conditioned on the previous character C, okay? Okay, and then you can estimate this probability, uh, again, using your corpus, and you got your probability, and then you can multiply this, and you get, and then you normalize, and you get the probabilities, okay? Everybody happy with that? Sorry? So the, this probability is just this one, probability of delete T given C, okay? So we approximate just using this, this one, okay? So that is that one, okay? So th this is from? From data. From the data we already know that yeah. these were the errors. Yeah. So you have a data, and then you just go and see, okay, how often did you delete the T when the previous character was C? And you, you do a count. Yeah? So that's easy. Right? Um, yep? Sorry, you need, can't hear. Okay, any other questions in the front while we deliver the mic to the back. Wouldn't it be better if we like, uh, know the context of the word in the sentence? Like yeah, I, as I said earlier, to, to, to do that for the whole word, the data is going to be very sparse. You would need a very large corpus with the incorrect and correct spellings. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, the question, remember that this class is going to be interactive, so you'll be a lot of questions. So, um, so which is the correct word? Okay, how many for actress? Okay. Okay, about 70%. Uh, okay. Any other word? Any other word? Sorry? No, we're only looking at across. Why would you choose across? That's only 18%. So what about acres? Okay, so what is the probability <coughs> that acres, the last one, is the correct one. The probability that this is correct is actually 
plus 23, 44%. So the correct word is acres, because there are two different ways you could have got acres. Okay? So you need to wake up. <laughs> okay? So now uh, uh, the correct word is acres, uh, given this data. And you're going to implement this a bit later. So I will provide this data. So this data is available for English, and that's all you need. And, you'll, and this data is also available. That's easy. Um, so then you can program this in Python later. OK, so now uh, moving on. So now we want to switch to semantics. <clears throat> so the key idea is that how do we estimate the meaning of a word without requiring a linguist, without having to pay a linguist, or without using a dictionary? Okay? So that is a fundamental problem in natural language processing, how to estimate the meaning of words without using a dictionary. Okay? So there are other such problems uh, I'll talk about in a second. Uh, all of them have to do with semantics. Okay? And the key challenge that natural language processing scientists have been trying to address is this problem. How can a machine learn an unknown language without human supervision? Okay? So let's say I don't know anything about Chinese, and I get a lot of sentences in Chinese and I want to build a machine learning system which will automatically tell me the meaning of the words, the meaning of the sentences, just by exposing to sentences, nothing else. Okay? Okay, <clears throat> so um, to address this problem, we use some ideas from linguistics. So we use what's known as the distributional hypothesis. It's a very old concept from the 50s, okay? which says that words that occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meanings. So that is, the meaning of a word can be defined uh, by its context. Okay? Or uh, in a slang language, the meaning of a word is defined by its friends. The friends it keeps. The friends are the words it often occurs with. Okay? So does that make sense? Okay, so the key idea is that if you see, if you want to figure out the me meaning of a word, is you look at all the words you see around it, and then you have some idea about the meaning of that word. Okay, so we can um, <clears throat> try to instantiate this idea into a concrete model using what's known as a word space model. So the mean of, meaning of a word is represented as a coherence vector built from a corpus, okay? So the idea is this. So let's say we want to estimate the meaning of the word apartment. So we look at, let's say, five words to the left and five words to the right. So we have a five-word context, left and right. So total 10 words, okay? And now we start counting. So we go through our corpus and we count how often we see I, how often we see went, how often we see to, and so on. And then we generate a count vector. So for the word house, we have this count vector. And now this is indexed by your whole vocabulary, your whole dictionary. So you have all the words in your dictionary, and then you put a count. Okay? And the count tells you how often these context words occur in a given context window. Okay? <clears throat> And now, uh, the idea is that if two words are similar in meaning, then their context vectors should look similar. So think of this context vector for the word apartment, and think of the uh, context ve vector for the word house. Okay? We would expect that the cosine similarity between, let's say, if this was a house and this was apartment, we would expect this vector to be very similar to this vector. So now if you convert this into a, a cosine metric, you would expect the cosine to be very high, right? In the high dimensional space, the two should point very similar, right? It should be close, okay? 
because the vectors are very similar. Okay, so we would do, we can do more sophisticated things instead of just doing counts. <coughs> so instead of using counts, we can do more clever things. We can use conditional probability, okay? Uh, <clears throat> But the problem with conditional probability is that if you have a word like a uh or the, you would see them everywhere. So you don't really want a uh or the, right? Because they're going to appear all the time. <clears throat> so um, you can use something what's known as pointwise mutual information, which just is a log on the joint probability times the individual marginal probabilities, okay? So that tells you how strongly they are associated, okay, with each other, okay. Um, so <clears throat> for so this is going to remove all the common words, because given a common word, the other word is not going to be very frequent. So the joint probability will be, uh, you know, so the, the will be low. <clears throat> okay, and then you can estimate these things from data. So by just doing counting, so this is just maximum likelihood estimation. <clears throat> okay, but one problem with using logs is that, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, <coughs> the log of numbers smaller than one becomes negative, right? So we don't want negative numbers. So one thing you can do is to just add a smoothing factor like a one, okay? So this is positively shifted PMI, and now you get uh, smoothed uh, numbers which are positive or non-zero, non okay? So you can do these tricks. <clears throat> so now uh, let's uh, say that we want to construct um, this. So now um, here's a simple experiment for you. What I want you to do is write down what you think this vector for apartment is going to look like, right? Okay, so here's my dictionary, and now I have normalized these counts such that they all add up to uh, their unit length, let's say. Okay, so you have house, hunting, and so on. So can you now figure out what apartment should look like? Okay, can you write it down? So at some point, I'm going to ask one of you to write down the answer to this. Okay, the answer is not an exact answer, right? So this is a rough answer. It's a guess. hunting, and so on. So can you now figure out what apartment should look like? Okay, can you write it down? So at some point, I'm going to ask one of you to write down the answer to this. Okay, the answer is not an exact answer, right? So this is a rough answer. It's a guess. Each other, so 
looking at the vocabulary, uh, if the uh, probability of animal is 0 0.1 in house, then it will be similar in apartment as well. And similarly for other uh, words, but uh, since uh, apartment belongs to apartment, so it should be a bit higher. Okay, very good, thanks. So she pointed out a good, yep. Okay, so, uh, so that means that, you know, just using the conditional probability is not a good idea. So if you use one of the other metrics, then the effect of apartment and apartment coming together would be uh, not so much, okay? Okay, so uh, moving on. <clears throat> So as I said, so which is more likely? So from this, uh, you should be able to say which one is more likely. Number one or number two? Okay, very good. The class is doing really well. <clears throat> okay, so given the distributional hypothesis, we would expect our apartment vector to look like this. Okay. <clears throat> So the question is, uh, why don't we just use this? What's the problem? Any, any answers to that? OK, those of you who have not read my slides. OK, so <laughs> yeah. OK, we have an answer. When we uh, add any word into the vocabulary, uh, all the probabilities must add to one. So uh, probability of previous data must be retweaked uh, in order to maintain that. So maybe that's one difficulty in this method. Um, not sure I understood the question. So when you add a new word. Yeah, I guess that. Uh, yeah, so when you add a new word, you have to extend. Yeah, the, the but dimension. Probabilities yeah. of all the You have to extend the more. dimension. So that's a very good point. So when you add a new word to your um, dictionary, you need to extend this. But typically, what we do in this kind of model, so that's a good point, is that we fix this vocabulary. So we would choose, let's say, the top 10,000 words, removing all the frequent words. So remove all the frequent words like ah, uh, da, and so on. And then we choose the remaining, let's say, 10,000 words. Okay? And then we do all the counting with respect to only those 10,000 words here. So this vocabulary will be fixed, okay? But the problem still remains that, uh, the, as has already been said, this is very sparse because, uh, <clears throat> because a lot of the words may not co-occur. You would not see them together in the corpus, even though they are related, okay? And the counts may not be very accurate. So to estimate this high dimensional vector from your corpus, you would need a very big corpus. And even that may not be good enough. So that is the key problem with a vector space model for words. Okay, so the VSM is an explicit representation that is very high dimensional. And it is also very, very sparse. <clears throat> okay. Um, however, uh, we also note that VSMs can recover the similarity in meaning between words, for example, using cosine similarity or KL divergence that uh, we looked at yesterday. Um, <clears throat> so the key point is that you can use this instead of using a dictionary or a thesaurus such as WordNet. So you can just use this. Um, <clears throat> so we expect the cosine similarity between book and novel to be very high, right? And similarly, uh, we would expect the cosine similarity, let's say, between book and hunting to be very, very low. Very good. Um, so, um, so as we just discussed, uh, VSMs would suffer from sparsity issues and generalize very poorly. Yes? In terms of finding similarity between vectors, why, why do you always generally use cosine similarity? I mean, uh, 
I've also used uh, Euclidean distance or Manhattan distance, but uh, generally people prefer cosine similarity. Is there any specific reason for that? That's a very good question, yes. So um, I'm not sure I have a good answer to that question. Um, <clears throat> so typically, uh, when you have a high dimensional representation, um, <clears throat> uh, cosine similarity is considered to be the best. Uh, typically speaking. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things about cosine similarity would be that compared to Euclidean distance is that, um, you know, in Euclidean distance is one of the, one of the uh, dimensions changes quite a lot. It would have quite a big effect on Euclidean distance, but not necessarily similar, so much effect on cosine distance. But actually, the real reason to answer this question is, is, is difficult. So I'm not sure I know the answer to this question. So it's a very good question. OK. <clears throat> so now the question is, what would be a better solution? So, so I gave you a solution. Then I told you that's rubbish. OK, so now what, what is a better solution? <coughs> So ideally speaking, what do you think would be a better solution? Any thoughts? So those of you who have not done NLP, especially. Okay, would anyone like to say? Okay, so, uh, so let me try to answer this question. So ideally what we want is that we want a representation which will give you a, a similarity score for all word pairs. You know, we don't want zeros because all words are similar to all other words, maybe very, sim very, very small amount of similarity, but nevertheless, some non-zero similarity. So we want a kind of a smooth similarity between all pairs of words, right? Uh, so because that's always going to be a better approximation compared to, you know, similarity, uh, which is when you just get zeros, for example, right? Especially for deep learning algorithms, if you have some similarity, you'll have a gradient. <clears throat> okay, um, so that's one thing. And the second thing would be that you, you you want to have uh, we want a low dimensional representation, okay? <clears throat> and that generalizes better, okay? So generalizes better meaning that it'll give you some similarity score for all pairs of words. <clears throat> so <clears throat> so that way we can work with smaller data sets too. Okay, now um, how do we construct this kind of representation? So we call this a word embedding, okay? So word embedding is kind of an alternative to a vector space model. So it's exactly like a vector space model, except that the dimension is short. So instead of having 10,000 or 20,000 dimension, we might have a dimension of 50, 100, or 200, maybe 300, okay? So it's fairly low dimensional. Uh, <clears throat> So we can set the problem of learning word and even sentence meanings as a machine learning task that requires some semantic interpretation, okay? So how can we uh, <coughs> set up this task? So one way would be we, we try to figure out a fill-in-the-bank blank problem. So we're going to say the dog blank the cat, okay? Not, not sure about bark because bark is intransitive. The chase is, is potentially transitive. Um, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so now, um, so we'll be doing this exercise later on in the lab. And now we input the dog, the cat. So two words to the left, two words to the right, let's say. Or four words to the left, four words to the right. And then we force our neural network to guess the meaning, the word. If it guesses correct, it gets a point, 
right? <clears throat> and we tell it what the, which is the correct words, possible correct words. There are multiple possible words, right? But the point here is that we're exploiting uh, um, <clears throat> some sort of semantic constraints on human language, which is that the type of thing that can go here, the type of thing, that type, the semantic type, is a limited class. So not all kinds of things, not all verbs can go there. If you, even if you restrict the verbs, not all kinds of verbs will go there, right? The dog employs the cat. <laughs> Very unlikely, right? The dog married the cat. Okay, that's unlikely. Okay, so there is a kind of a semantic constraint that we human beings use in understanding language, and we're trying to force the machine to also uncover those kinds of constraints, those kinds of, uh, or exploit that regularity. Okay, <clears throat> I went to the party wearing a nice. Okay. If you're a woman, a nice dress. If you're a man, a nice tie, maybe. <laughs> okay? But again, the point is that the class of things that goes there is some sort of clothing, most likely. Yeah? So the semantic type is restricted. Okay? <clears throat> so here we have the things that can go before dog and after dog. So from the dog, we want to predict all the things on the left, from the dog, we want to predict all the things on the right. Okay, fat dog chases, right? My dog bites, etc. Okay? <clears throat> we could also use uh, more complicated data sets. So, so this is becoming more popular in NLP at the moment. So you could have a data set which have pairs of words. Okay, so I heated the food the food got hot, okay? Does, if you did that, does it imply this is what happened? So does, it, does this entail this? Yes, right? So you'd have a data set where we have these semantic interpretation problems where it could be entails, contradicts, or unrelated, okay? I heated the food, <clears throat> and then, you know, um, there was a there was a you know fight in the streets that would be unrelated right i heated the food the food got cold okay so you could have these pairs and so people have constructed these pairs and then given it to thousands of people using mechanical turk and uh, generated these kinds of data sets okay <clears throat> so now you can imagine a, a neural network algorithm which will take this input and that input and has to predict one of these classes, right? And in doing so, it has to learn the representation of these words that will allow it to predict these classes. <clears throat> so now, um, we're going to do a little exercise in a second for each of these tasks, we can generate a training data set containing correct and incorrect predictions. So for these three tasks, you don't need any annotation, any labels. We can generate these labels automatically, right? So this is also known as you know, self-training, <clears throat> uh, or you can call it unsupervised, <clears throat> whereas for this one, this is a supervised task, okay? So we would expect that, for an example, like the dog chases the cat, where you have the left context and the right context, and the output is chases, this should give high probability, right? And bites, you find it in the corpus, it should also give very high probability, okay? And then if, you, if there are multiple sentences containing the ch chases, you would expect much higher probability for chases. And if you have only a small number of examples with bytes, you would expect a smaller probability, right? And then you can generate these negative examples uh, automatically. So you can just choose some random words and just put it there, right? So your randomly chosen words would have a high probability that it's negative, right? 
So you just sample some random words and put it and treat it as a negative example. Okay? So now you have your data set. And now each of these arrows you can think of as a machine learning model that we train using this training data to do this prediction. Okay? <clears throat> so um, the word embedding setup is as follows. So for every word, you're going to have uh, embedding. So this is exactly like your vector space model, except that this is low dimensional, typically 100 dimensions, right? <clears throat> so John camera likes to so have this embedding table. And this is your input sentence, John likes camera. Okay? Now, what you do is that you do not make a copy of this vector and supply it here. What instead you do is you keep a pointer back to this table. Okay? So you have a pointer back to this table, John. So that's the first word going in. Second word, likes. You have a pointer back into likes. Camera, you have a pointer back here. Okay? And now you have a prediction task. John likes camera. That's a positive sentiment. Okay? If you imagine this is a sentiment classification problem, John likes camera is positive. John does not like camera is negative. Okay? So let's say you have a simple positive negative classification. You have a one or zero task here, prediction task. Right? Okay? So um, <clears throat> now, um, using your loss, and you do a back propagation, this back propagation will update this global table directly. Right? So the embedding itself is going to change, right, when you do a back propagation. Okay, so you have a couple of different settings now. One setting is that using the previous idea, right, using this idea, you can learn, <coughs> you can learn, <coughs> you can learn these embeddings, right? And in that case, oops, in that case, you freeze these embeddings, right? You learned it, and now you freeze it. Okay? You don't change it. And now you do the back propagation only in, the, in this network until you get this prediction correct. Okay? So you run the back propagation only in this part until you get the prediction correct. Okay? So that's one scenario. I know this, so that is known as transfer learning because we have learned the embedding using an unsupervised method from a large corpus. Right? Okay? Like in the VSM, we have learned this right, previously, and now we freeze it. And now, once you've frozen this, that's a fixed table, that doesn't change, no back propagation. And now, you only change the, the, the weights in this neural network, okay, until you get this prediction correct. So that's one setting using trans transfer learning. And there are pre-trained embeddings available, such as word to vec glove, and so on. <clears throat> or you can... Uh, not use, you can not use this embedding, so you randomly generate this embedding, just random numbers. So you initialize this randomly, and now you apply in this task. And now you back propagate all the way here. So in doing this, you learn both the embedding and the parameters of this neural network for this task. So you have a task specific embedding that you've learned, okay, in a supervised setting. Is that clear? Okay. Or you can do a combination. You can start with a pre-trained embedding, right? Freeze this to begin with, freeze this, learn these parameters, and then unfreeze this and update both, right? Okay? So you can do a combination. Okay, so here's some classwork. <coughs> So we have this example, and you have now studied both uh, multi-layer perceptrons, so MLP, dense layers, right? You, you know how to do dense layers. You know how to do convolutions. You looked at convolutions yesterday. So using either dense layers or convolution layers, can you design this arrow? So what should this arrow be? That's going to take an embedding of the two words to the left, two words to the right, and predicts this word, okay? 
So design your neural network on a, like graphically, okay? Just with a diagram, no code. <coughs> okay? And as I said, this, these come from a table, so this the and this the is the same, actually, even though I've repeated it, it's coming from the same. It's because it's a pointer, right? It's the same entry. <coughs> Now we have to design some neural network. So this is the bit I'm asking you to design. So this is going to be input here. So this could be, a, for example, a CNN, or it could be a dense layer. And now we have to predict <clears throat> changes, right, or bytes, okay? So how would you go about doing it? So for the correct one, it should give high probability. And for the incorrect one, it should give low probability. That's one way of setting the problem. OK, so everybody start doing some diagrams. Blank, okay? So actually, let's try to remove this. Oh. Okay. So one setting would be that we have a training data where we feed it the dog, the cat, and changes. OK. And this network should give you one as the output, OK? Okay, so we're going to fill this blank here. Okay. No, it's okay. You don't need to. We've already got a copy there. Okay. Okay, but uh, from the dense, how are you going to generate uh, one there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, somebody help him out. So what is the... What is the non-linearity at the end, and what is the loss you're going to use? So what's the non-linearity on the top? OK, it has to be sigmoid, because it's binary. And the loss is going to be binary cross entropy. OK. Okay, we, we got that, we got that. Thank you. <laughs> Things, what other type of loss we could use? For example, can we use cosine? If we are going to change this loss to cosine, 
how the, would the structure of this network change? Sorry? Uh, the cosine distance should be zero at the last layer, the loss. Oh, cosine between what? Remember, cosine has two inputs. Okay, between the two words. Sigmoid has got only one way. input. Between what? So, uh, the cosine distance between the ground truth and the given okay. sequence of words. So what is the ground truth here? Uh, theta. Theta. No. Where is the theta? Okay. So uh, alternatively, uh, what you could do is that you could <coughs> force your network to generate an embedding of these dense layers to be an embedding, right? So because, right, it could be embedding itself, right? And now you can compare the cosine similarity between these two. Okay? All right? So for the correct input, so this forces the network to actually predict an embedding itself, right? And now, uh, you would expect that the cosine for the correct embedding to be high and for the incorrect to be low. Okay? Uh, sir, are we updating uh, the word embedding on uh, yeah. uh, output also? Like yeah, changes? so you could, you could, uh, you would, so you you could you could have it update everything mm -hmm. right so you could set it up so that the updates happen to everything uh, so this is not like regular uh, architecture that we did yesterday like share and because there will be two uh, two layers like uh, one one for uh, output like the ground level which will also be updated right sir like changes uh, the the word embedding on changes yeah, I mean, if you're doing image classification or something else, then, then you know, you don't have this. So there's no need to update this mm -hmm. because you only have a class, right? Okay, um, so um, I think uh, I need to move on. So I'm going to run out of time. So let's move on, okay? So now you could change this architecture to a CNN architecture as well and have these two different types of losses, for example. Okay, so these are things you could try. A uh, learning toolkit, uh, and it can generate you know various different types of embedding depending on the different settings, the different training settings. So a popular one is the, what's known as the skipgram embedding. So in the skipgram embedding, you are just trying to predict, um, <clears throat> given the target word, so given the word in the middle. You're trying to predict all the words to the left, all the words to the right, within, let's say, a window of two words, a window of five words, right? So your positive example is the, the target word and the correct context word within a window, like two words to the left, two words to the right, okay? And the negative words are words which are, uh, you know, some randomly chosen words, right? Which are uh, which is going to be unlikely in the in the context. Okay. <clears throat> so the yeah. So we are running half an hour late. So uh, I think we're going to finish maybe twenty minutes late, and we'll have a shorter lunch break, like an hour lunch break. Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> So the, the definition of the context could be arbitrary. It could be just a words window. It could be connected by a parse tree. So I'll show you some example of a parse tree based context. <clears throat> so in this case, what's happening is that each word is associated with two embeddings, a word embedding and is context embedding. 
So each word has two embeddings, one as a word and one as a context, right? Uh, so the, when the words appears as a context, you use one embedding. When the word appears as a target word, you use another embedding. So you have two tables, okay? So, so that's why every context C is associated with also two embeddings. It's uh, word embedding <clears throat> and it's context embedding C, okay? Is that clear? So for a context word, you have its context embedding C from the context table. And for the word embedding, you have the word embedding, right? So there are two embedding tables. <clears throat> And then uh, you try to optimize this log likelihood, okay? <clears throat> or this likelihood. <clears throat> so you want the positive examples to have very high probability, and you want the negatives to have very low probability, okay? So for every single positive example, W and C, you would have <clears throat> multiple uh, negative examples. Okay, so you, the CN is the list of negative examples, and you would have uh, multiple negative examples. Okay, so this is your, uh, so you have one positive example, so this is the target word, and you have one positive context word, and then, then you have a whole bunch of negative words, okay, which are randomly chosen. And then you want the probability of these two to be high and the probability of these other ones from to be low, okay? So hence, the, if you put a log into it, you get the log likelihood, okay? And now, uh, like I showed you in class, you can uh, compute the derivatives, okay? So you can do your derivatives and then do apply a gradient descent algorithm, okay? So the point I'm trying to show you here is that there's no deep learning involved, okay? So you can just do this by writing some piece of code. <coughs> okay? So now, uh, <coughs> so you can compute these derivatives and then you can run um, these updates. So in every, with every example, you can do an update for the vector for the context word so, for, sorry, for the target word and for the context word. And also you can do it for every negative example, okay? So you'll generate a huge amount of data with the correct target word and the correct context word, the correct target word and the incorrect target word. Generate these, just the pairs of words, right? And you have positive and negative and you use these equations to do your updates, okay? <clears throat> So now, uh, moving on to something slightly different, we could also use syntactic context to generate our embeddings. So this is known as dependency parsing. So here you have, she asked for a cup of coffee, and she is the subject of ask, right? And the modifier for ask is for a cup of coffee, and the head is of this for expression is cup, right? And cup is the noun, and it has a determiner in front, and this cup is modified by of coffee, right? So what is the cup of? You want a cup of coffee, right? And she asks for what, right? So for something, okay? So you have the syntactic expression. Another example, very predictable, but still entertaining. Um, so very is a uh, adverb modifier, all right? Uh, and you have a conjunction, right? And but, which, and it's still entertaining. So it still is an adverb modifier as well. And but is a conjunction, okay? So ahead of this conjunction phrase is entertaining. Okay, so you have um, something like that. And now what you can do is that instead of just saying that I just want to look for words to the left and right, you can say, well, uh, for the word cup, I have these context words, right? Which is uh, uh, one, two, three, four. Four words to the left and four words to the right, so everything. But you also have the immediate syntactic context, okay? 
So from cup, you can go to this one. You have an edge, n mod 4, right? But this is pointing in this direction. So going in this direction is going to be inverse, right? So n mod 4 inverse and ask. So you have this edge going like that. And similarly, you have this edge, right? Right? This is off n mod coffee, OK? And then you have this 4 as well. OK? So you can have these uh, contexts. So you can generate these contexts and then treat them just like words, right? So you generate a data set where you have these, these edges and the target word. And then you think of them just like words. And now you construct your embedding table, OK? And you generate these positive and negative examples, OK? And I'll show you that using this kind of mechanism gives you much better results compared to using standard word to vec for example. OK, so moving on. <clears throat> so if you use something like word to vec um, you would find that <clears throat> word to vec exhibits this kind of property, that if you take the vector of woman and subtract with man, this vector will be very similar to the difference between queen and king. OK? So, um, so that means king minus man plus woman should be very similar to queen. OK? So now I can ask a question, like if London is to England, sorry, if England is to London, what is to Baghdad? So this is an analogy question. Right? If L England is to London, what is to Baghdad? Right? And the answer is Iraq, obviously. Right? Because Iraq is in the same relationship to Baghdad as England is to London. So we can set this up as an argmax problem with the cosine distance. So you go through your whole vocabulary and find the best expression which is similar in the, in the cosine distance to this expression. Right? And you can automatically solve these analogy problems using embeddings. Okay? And the question is, why does uh, word embeddings behave like this? And that's because word embeddings have this directional similarity, in the sense that if you look in the high dimensional space, uh, the direction between man and woman is going to be very similar to the direction between uncle and aunt and king and queen. OK? So hence, you can do this subtraction, OK, to compute this, this, this vector here between queen and king, OK? <clears throat> so if you try to do a, two, a low dimensional projection, um, uh, so this is a two dimensional projection of your high dimensional vectors, you would see that the country and capitals roughly align, are aligned. They are not exactly correct, but they are very, uh, very good. OK, um, so another thing to note is that <clears throat> essentially, uh, if you think about a Skipgram model, so you have two embeddings. You have your uh, word embeddings for the words, and for the words as context, you have this context embedding, right? And D is the dimension, so 50 or 100 or 200, whatever your dimension. So every word is here a vector, like in this table, right? So you have the words here, and these are the embeddings for each word, right? Along the rows. And the columns, you have the embeddings for the context uh, words. So, the, so here we have row vectors, here we have column vectors. OK? And so essentially, what is happening is that if you have your uh, word co-occurrence matrix, so that is word to context matrix, so this is high dimensional. So this is your original matrix, like I showed you, right? Using PPMI or some metric. So here we are talking about PMI, right? Positive uh, pointwise mutual information, the formula I showed you earlier. So, but it could be other things. So you have this matrix of counts, or PMIs. 
And now, essentially, what, is, what we, it has been shown is that the skipgram model learns a matrix factorization. So it is able to factorize this matrix into these two smaller matrices, such that when you multiply these two matrices, you get the original matrix. Okay? So now you can see that we have a low dimensional projection from W to D, and then uh, similarly we have a low dimensional projection of C into D, such that the multiplication gives you your original matrix. Okay? So mathematically you can think of uh, these methods are doing some kind of uh, matrix factorization. Okay, um, uh, so I'm going to skip this, not uh, that important. So actually what, ha what is happening is that the skipgram actually learns um, a matrix factorization which is shifted by some constant. Okay, and this is right from Homo Levy. Okay, now I want to move to the final topic. Okay, should finish in five or ten minutes. So uh, typically in natural language processing, we have a number of tasks. So we want to break down the problem of understanding sentences into smaller parts. Okay, so one. <coughs> so some of these tasks are things like named entity recognition, relation extraction, part of speech tagging, sentiment analysis, and so on. So. <coughs> we can view all of these tasks as some sort of sequence classification task. Okay, so that means the input is a sequence of words, and the output is some label for every word, or a label for the whole sentence. Right? So let's look at named entity recognition. So we have sentence something like this. Kenneth Joseph Lenihan, a New York research sociologist who helped refine the scientific methods used in criminology, died 25 May at his home in Manhattan. Okay, so <clears throat> what we are trying to do in named entity recognition is that we're trying to look at all the noun phrases and automatically saying what kind of noun phrase it is. Okay, so let, let me give you an example. Yeah, let's say I said. Um, uh, let's meet at um, Bajay's house this evening. Okay? Okay? Let's meet at Bajay's house this evening. Okay? Okay, now I'm going to ask you, what is Bajay's house? Is that my grandfather's house? What is it? Okay? Okay? Okay, so a lot of people are saying it's a restaurant. If you're hungry, we can say that it's a restaurant. Okay, so that means the, the semantic class of this noun phrase, Bajay's house, is dependent on the context. Yeah? And it is not possible to use a dictionary to figure out the meaning, the semantic class of a noun phrase, because the meaning is very much dependent on the context. Okay, so you use a dictionary-based method, it's not going to work that well. Okay, so, um, uh, so, uh, so typically in natural language processing, we try to use the context to automatically figure out um, what type of class it is. Okay, so we call this entity recognition. Okay, so the entity here is a noun phrase, and then we want to classify the noun phrase into some classes we have a predefined set of classes. So here, we're going to say that uh, Kenneth Joseph Lenihan, so we need to say that actually it's not three people, this is just one person, okay? So we need to identify that this is one person, and then we need to say it's a person, okay? We, we want to say that New and York are not two different things, it's the same thing, same entity, and it's a location. Right? Similarly, Manhattan and May 25 is a temporal entity. So we want to go through a corpus and automatically identify the entity types. How can we identify those? So, uh, so, um, so it's easy. So this is a supervised learning problem. So we have training data, and using the training data and using our word embeddings, we will be able to identify um, 
the, the, both the span and the class, okay? Okay, uh, relation extraction. So I'll give you a minute to read this. Okay, so um, we can see that here, uh, Norwich City is an organization, sports organization. Birmingham City is actually not the city here. It's actually the football club. So it has to identify it's a sports organization, right? Uh, 20 Birmingham fans uh, is some person, but it's a group. Uh, and CS Gas here is a weapon. And furthermore, actually, bar stools is also a weapon in this particular case, because uh, football supporters can find all kinds of weapons. <laughs> okay, so um, so here we have these identified relations. So, 20 Birmingham fans, Birmingham City. The relationship between these two entities is a membership relation. Uh, here, between uh, Birmingham, Birmingham fans and CS Gas is chemical weapon. Possession and Birmingham fans and bar stools is a weapon possession as well. Okay, so we can use the relation extraction to go from unstructured text to a structured representation, right? So that is one of the goals of a natural language processing. One of the many goals is that we would go from an unstructured textual representation to a very rough semantic understanding of the text using relation extraction and entity recognition. Right? So for the entity recognition problem, the typically one way to think about it is that if you find, let's say, three entities in your sentence, you're going to say, okay, what is the relationship between every pair? So A, B, C, what relation is there between A and B? If there is, there may or may not be. What is the relation between B and C? Right? What is the relation between A and C? Right? So pairwise, and you have a fixed set of relations, a large set of relations, and you say, okay, this relations exist. So this gives you a very rough understanding of the text, allows you to go from unstructured representation to a knowledge-based type of representation. Okay? Now, uh, for sequence classification problems, a good example is sentiment analysis. So you have a sentence uh, such as, <clears throat> the food was not that bad, and apparently it's positive. Okay? According to this data set. The food was great, positive. Food was okay, positive. I hated the curry, definitely negative. Okay? So in coarse grain sentiment analysis, one way would be users have two labels, which is positive or negative, and for a given sentence, you want to classify it as positive or negative. Okay? <clears throat> okay, so moving on. So uh, one strategy would be that if you're able to learn your word embeddings, you already learned your word embeddings, then you <clears throat> then you feed your word embeddings into a neural network and you generate your classification task, okay? You solve your classification problem. But one problem is that you're going to have is that how can you encode a variable length sentence into a fixed length vector? Because the length of the sentence is going to be not the same, okay? So one way you could do it is by padding. So you assume that the maximum length of your sentence is 50 or 100 or something, and you, you would you chop it up if it is bigger than that. If it is less than that, you just put zeros. You pad with zeros, okay? So that's one approach. Um, another approach would be you can do uh, various things. So you can sum the vectors and compute the average. So you can compute um, an average. Or you can compute a row-wise maximum, okay? 
they can do a maximum for, for, for each row. So these are the possibilities you have. <clears throat> um, so now, uh, moving on to CNNs, so alternatively what you could do is that you could take your input, pad it with zeros if you want, right? And then apply a CNN architecture to do your prediction at the end, okay? And then the key point about this kind of architecture, this kind of architecture is generic in the sense that you could have different uh, sequence uh, labeling problems or sequence classification problems, but your architecture is fixed, right? So you use the same architecture for multiple different problems, right? So this is an answer to the question about how to do CNN-based word embeddings. So you could do your CNN-based word embeddings using a setup like this, okay? Um, this particular specific um, architecture is not that important. You could choose arbitrarily different architectures, right? Um, so you have your input, the cat sat on the mat, and here's the embedding for the, this is the embedding for cat, this is the embedding for sat, and so on, right? And now uh, you do some convolutions, so this one has got two different channels, and you, then you do some pooling, you do some more convolutions, right? And here you, go, you do some subsampling. And then you finally push all the outputs. So these are your final learned features. So these are the features you've learned. And then you put it through a fully connected layer, a dense layer. And then on top of that, you have whatever you're trying to predict, OK? So if it is a binary classification task, you have a sigmoid. If you have a multi-class classification task, you have a softmax. Right? If your output is a vector, then you could be something like this. Right? Okay. So, um, so this was a slide, in fact, uh, uh, Chris also had in his slide. Um, so what they showed was that if you input the cat sat on the red mat, for example, uh, what the CNN learns is very strong connections uh, like this for the right kind of paths, which roughly corresponds to a parse tree, okay? So it's able to recover the internal syntactic structure uh, by just doing training on the sentiment analysis problem, okay? <clears throat> okay, um, so going back to um, the embeddings I showed you, uh, this is the <clears throat> Oops. So, <clears throat> so, um, so in this paper here, uh, we have uh, built our embeddings using these kinds of context. Okay, and this embedding is uh, you can download this from our website. Um, and what we're able to show is that using these kinds of embeddings. you can achieve uh, very good results. So our results are, for example, about 84% using a CNN, and this was the, the best state of the art a few years ago, so 2016. So the difference was only 4%, uh, whereas this one was a very complicated model. So using a simple model but better embeddings, you can get pretty good results. Okay? So now um, I want to say a little bit about um, where we are. <clears throat> so the key point is that doing deep compositional semantics is still a challenge for current machine learning methods, including current deep learning methods, right? So, and why is that? Well, one reason you can think about is what's known as long distance dependencies. So here, uh, if you look at this example, Lord of the Rings, I read, this sentence is equivalent to I read Lord of the Rings. I read Lord of the Rings moves here, right? Lord of the Rings I managed to read is equivalent to I managed to read Lord of the Rings. I believe John managed to read Lord of the Rings is equivalent to Lord of the Rings I believe John managed to read, right? So in all of these constructions, what has happened is that this noun phrase has moved from this position originally to here. And this distance could be very long. Right? Okay? 
So for a neural network to keep track of where this thing has come from becomes more difficult. And so we want to be able to generate the same meaning representation for this sentence and the same meaning representation for this sentence, right? So that's not that easy, okay? But using the old methods, using a logic-based representation, this was easy problem, okay? But using a hand-crafted rule was not very good either because it didn't, it didn't handle ungrammatical sentences, right? So now we have the ability that our neural networks can handle ungrammatical sentences pretty well, doesn't require any grammar, but on the other hand, uh, it's not so good as generating meaning representations that are equivalent for uh, multiple syntactic configurations which have the same meaning. Okay? <clears throat> so, you know, there, there are uh, plenty of uh, constraints on these type of uh, constructions. So you have things like Kim, Sandy loves Bill is not acceptable because Sandy already loves Bill, so you can't have Kim there. <laughs> in the gray suit, Sandy loves the man, right? So Sandy loves the man in the gray suit. So in the gray suit is a prepositional modifier for the man, and the modifier cannot be moved out. Okay? <clears throat> Mary ordered cake and soda, so you cannot move out this soda out and say, what did Mary order cake and? Okay? John saw Mary's brother. Whose did John see brother? That doesn't work out. What did John like Mary surprise everyone? Who did that John like surprise everyone? Okay, that doesn't work out. So you're not able to move out this Mary out into that position. Okay, so now, uh, very quickly, I'll try to finish. So we're going to look at sequence models. <clears throat> so nowadays, uh, most uh, deep learning models for NLP use some kind of sequence model. Okay, although I would say, uh, you know, there is still ongoing debate in terms of whether a CNN model with some attention is better than a uh, a sequence model, okay? So there are pros and cons to this. So I'll only be talking about sequence models here, okay? So a key idea in a sequence model is that you have a cell and it outputs this hidden state. So that puts some number here, okay? And this number is fed to itself. So the idea is that this is your input. Let's say the cat sat on the mat, okay? And you feed this to this cell, and the output of this, you feed it to itself. So this A is the same thing as this one, okay? So the parameters are shared in all of this, okay? And each of these shells, uh, cells output this hidden representation, okay? So this is the unrolling of this cell, okay? So is that clear? So it is basically a cell with a loop. Okay, and so the first word goes into the cell and the output of the cell goes at input to the next one, right? Okay, so the problem uh, with the standard uh, RNN um, is that if you have something like, you know, I, I grew up in Nepal and I speak fluent, what? Sorry? I speak fluent Nepali. But why should I say Nepali here and not French? Because I've seen this Nepal here, okay? So for this language modeling problem, um, this RNN has to keep track. It has to remember this Nepal all the way here. It has to remember that this Nepal has come here. And at this point, when it sees fluent, it says, ah, it must be Nepali, okay? If it is now, as the sequence becomes very long and long, remember this is a single cell, right? This is not multiple cells. It's the same cell with the same parameters. Trying to keep track of this becomes very difficult, right? 
So after, once the sequence becomes very long, it's going to forget that it was Nepal. And then it's going to generate an incorrect prediction. Right? <clears throat> so standard RNNs have this problem. <clears throat> so to avoid this situation, uh, LSTM models were invented. So LSTM stands for Long Short Term Memory Networks. So it has got an explicit mechanism to store the memory and then release it uh, at a given point later on. Okay? So, um, so the LSTM consists of a cell state. So it has got two hidden states. One is known as a cell state, and the other is known as a hidden state. Okay? So it outputs these two. Okay? So we have this hidden state here. This is the same as this one. So this and this is the same. And then it outputs this cell state as well. Okay? And it uses <coughs> these gates. So it has an input gate, forget gate, and an output gate. Okay? So uh, we will look at what each of these does. So the input gate decides how much of the previous cell state to carry forward. Okay? So this is the input gate. So every time you see a multiply, that's a gate. Okay? And the forget gate decides how much of the current hidden state to mix with the previous state. Yeah? <coughs> So the forget gate decides how much of the new information it should mix with the previous right, cell state. Okay? So the first one decides, OK, I ha I'm carrying all this information. I'm going to forget some of it. Okay? And the next one decides, OK, I've forgotten something. Now I need to add some new information to it. I'm going to decide how much of the new information I'm going to add, mix it. Okay? <clears throat> And then we have the output gate. So this output gate decides how much of the new, stale, new cell state to output as the new hidden state. Okay. Okay. So um, <clears throat> so if nothing happens, there's nothing changing. Then you would see that the previous cell state just passes through like a highway, right? So the previous cell state just goes through like that, OK? <clears throat> OK, so, um, so <clears throat> doing the maths is quite easy. The key point is that You can think of each of these sigmoids as, as a, like a tap, OK? The tap decides how much of this thing is going to go, OK? Because the sigmoid outputs a number between 0 and 1, and you multiply this number with this one, OK? So if this number is 1, then all of this will go through. If the, if, if the output of this number is 0, nothing will go through, OK? So this sigmoids output like a volume control, like a tap, right? Which decides how much of the water is going to go through. And then you can think of this as the water. Okay? So each of those crosses are like taps. Okay? And the maths is easy, so it's because you know how the sigmoid operates. So you calculate the sigmoid, and every time you see a cross, you do a multiplication. Okay? <clears throat> OK, so, so this multiplication, as you can see here, is what is coming out here. OK? Now, for the new information, so you have the new information xt. So this is a new word and the previous hidden state. So that is mixed together. OK? So you have a tan edge here. All the tan edge does is moves the number, stretches it between minus 1 and plus 1. OK? Because Tanya's shape is going from minus 1 to plus 1, OK? Just stretches it and ensures that it is between minus 1 and plus 1. And then, uh, oops. <clears throat> and now you're going to decide how much of this information you're going to allow it, OK? So you have, <clears throat> now you have a tap here, which is going to decide 
how much of this new information needs to go in. Okay? So you have this new information, you've decided how much of this new information needs to go out. And now you combine, simply add these two. Okay? So here you've subtracted some information from the old cell state. Here you have subtracted some information from the new state, and now you mix these two. Okay? So now your new cell state is given by this equation. Okay? <clears throat> And then you have the output gate, which is controlled exactly in the same way. So you have your cell state, okay, and you have your input. And based on the input, you decide how much of this cell state is the go as a new hidden state. Okay? So that's the basic idea. So you have these taps or gates, they're, they're called. They're also called attention, okay? So we'll look at attention in a second. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to skip this. So we also have uh, something known as GRU, which is a bit simpler version of an LSTM. Uh, <clears throat> so now, uh, here's a kind of a typical LSTM architecture for sequence labeling problems, okay? <clears throat> so here we have the labels, which says beginning, begin of a person, right? So you have something like New York, right? Uh, well, not New York, New York, let's say John. So this is the beginning of John, okay? This one is outside, and this is the beginning of a location. Let's say New, okay? So we're starting a location, and the next one would be uh, inside location, okay? So we have these labels which say begin, outside, or inside, okay? So every word is inside some entity type, that could be at the start of the entity, or it could be outside, okay? And each of these layers will predict this, okay? So here we have all kinds of embeddings. So you have your word embedding. You could also have your character embedding. You can do an embedding for every letter, right? So if you have the word John, you have an embedding for J, O, H, N, and you add them up and average, okay? So that is your character embedding. Okay, you have the case feature, which is whether the uppercase or lowercase, right? You combine all this, this is concatenation, and then you feed it to an LSTM network, okay? So this is a single cell. So one going forward, Mark visited Paris, going forward, the other going backwards, okay? So you have these two networks going forwards and backwards. And then you have a... <coughs> prediction layer. Remember that this is a single cell, so this is the same as this one. And you have another cell, so this is the same as this one, same as this one, okay? And you stack multiples of this, so you have 10 or 20 or 50 of these running all together, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> so this, uh, known as a bi-LSTM architecture, this is popular for uh, sequence labeling problems such as part of speech tagging, name entity recognition, sentiment analysis. Okay? So, this is uh, some evaluation result. I need to stop. So, in two minutes, I'm going to stop. <clears throat> so, using the kind of embeddings I just described earlier, so this is our embeddings. Yeah? So, this is our embeddings. Um, you can see the training size. So the glove embeddings on Stanford was trained on 480 billion words. So that's a very big corpus. Our embeddings were trained on 2 billion words. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and in these two papers, they were able to show that for most of the task, like part of speech tagging, chunking, named in recognition, event recognition, and so on, um, uh, these embeddings perform much better than compared to the very famous uh, GLOVE embeddings. Okay? And the reason is that, as I showed you earlier, uh, in these embeddings, we are taking advantage of the syntactic structure. Right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the classwork would be now, can we do the same using an LSTM model? Okay? So that will be lab work. We don't have time for class work. So, um, <clears throat> so now uh, we will do this um, 
in class. I'll probably just do this and stop. So, um, <clears throat> so let's assume that we are trying to do machine translation. Okay. So one way we're going to approach machine translation is that we have a encoder and a decoder. Okay. So each one of them could be a LSTM. So the encoder encodes some sentence. Let's say you know John visits Paris. Right. End of sentence. And now, um, when you reach the end of sentence, it should output the first word in the new language. I know. So let's say this is Nepali, John Paris Goyo, right? So now John visits Paris, should output John. Now if we feed this John as the input here, right? Now it should output Paris, okay? And then we feed Paris here it should output Gaio. And then it should output end of sentence, because it's finished. OK? So that is the standard architecture. <clears throat> so in this architecture, uh, <clears throat> the encoder encodes the whole sentence into a compressed representation, W. right? And the decoder starts decoding this W. OK? And each step, the decoder is fed the previous word to generate the next word. And this decoding will stop when the end of sentence token is generated. So this is a simple architecture that does a pretty good job for machine translation. Okay. So we'll be doing an experiment on this uh, this evening. Okay. So I have actually quite a few slides, but I've run out of time to look at attention-based models. So we're going to. I'm going to not do this. So I've got three slides. Okay. So I'm going to stop now and then uh, let you ask maybe one or two questions and we go for lunch. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Time for one or two questions. So these two billion words were taken from a dump of Wikipedia, English Wikipedia. So just all the sentences. Sorry? That can be repetitive or every word is unique? No, no, no. All the sentences. It's, it's not too... So that's a sent, uh, paragraph. All the sentences, yeah. Because the vocabulary is not going to be 2 billion. Yeah, the vocabulary is... Way. No, this is 2 billion word corpus. The size of all the words. Any other question? Yeah. Um, so around for word embeddings, like they started becoming popular after the results from word to back. Uh, where was it the case of the machinery becoming available for doing so, uh, such kind of stuffs, or where or was there some non-obvious thing about learning embeddings in this way? Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. I think uh, your question is more like. Um, is it easy to train word embedding models uh, in conventional no. architectures? Is that the question? Uh, no. It's, uh, was it uh, a very novel idea to train embeddings in this way, or was it the idea was there, it's just the machinery wasn't available? No, I, I, I would say the, it, it was definitely very novel, because as you see, uh, before that, we were still using vector space models, right? We had no idea how to go into a low-dimensional representation. Um, as it turned out, uh, as uh, Levy and Goldberg showed in their paper, that actually um, word embeddings is just a low-dimensional matrix factorization, but we only knew that later. Uh, so yes, I think it was a big step. Word embeddings was definitely the big step that allowed natural language processing to progress to what it is currently. Oh, sorry. Hello. Uh, regarding the app, the encoder decoder setup, I was curious about if whether uh, we encoded a, a sentence in a passive, in an active or a passive voice, does the decoder output this in the same act, active or passive voice? Okay, that, that's a very good question. Um, so, um, if your word embeddings um, are, you know, for a whole word, 
then, uh, then we would expect that with enough training data, it should do that correctly. But there are problems with this kind of encoder-decoder architectures, which I have not managed to talk about. So, so yeah. But in principle, yes, this, this should be.